Okay, we're back. We're live. We're talking to Gary Kondakar, our correspondent in Brussels. That's why we call it Midnight in Brussels. And uh, we usually catch her sleeping. And then we talk to her and she tells us what the news is in, uh, in Europe. So we try to stay current, you know, on what is really going on in Europe. And we've talked about so many things over the past few months. And there are tons of things still to talk about happening in Europe that we here in Hawaii never hear about. So we are delighted to have her on the line with us. Hi, Gowrie. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> what an honor. We'd love to have you. So uh, you sent me an email with uh, no less than 30 possible news stories. And uh, so we'll start, we'll start at the beginning and we'll see how far we get. So there was a meeting recently, um, on, I guess on Brexit, between um, Merkel, Hollande, and um, what's his name from, uh, from Italy? Three of them. Renzi. Matteo Renzi. Yeah, Frenzy. And, um, and this, this has implications. Uh, they're trying to shore up the situation. They're trying to get the EU strong. Uh, why did they have the meeting? What did they talk about? And what was the reaction after people heard what they did? Well, basically, um, the meeting to, uh, it's a show of unity. Um, most importantly, until uh, Britain left the EU, it was uh, one of the three largest countries along with France and Germany. Um, but now that the UK will be leaving, uh, Italy has taken its place as the top three largest countries in the EU and these countries also need to um, lead the EU because that's how it works in terms of voting and, um, uh, and, and, and political pull basically and Italy is a strong international player as well. So this is basically a show, it's to um, reassure markets and, and reassure the populations that uh, Europe is going to move stronger and, and, and uh, and go ahead in terms of integration. Um, but what's uh, interesting is that um, they're meeting in a, in a specific island called uh, Ventotene, where a manifesto for a federation of European states was signed. Um, but also it was, um, uh, it, it was where Altiero Spinelli and he's he, he was an anti-fascist. He, he began writing this federation mm. uh, of Europe. So it's more about also a symbol to counter nationalism, which is of course growing across the world as we see now, even in the United States. So it's more symbolic. Yeah, really, I mean, we have a, an interesting mix. And I guess you, you could say this is happening in uh, 2016. You have some people, and sometimes the same people, who, uh, who 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 want to you know go back to nationalism, and then you have other people who want to do away with borders entirely and feel that borders are irrelevant now these days, and we would all do better without them. Uh, and in Europe, yeah. I I think you hear both voices uh, speaking in Europe. Uh, so these guys are talking about uh, putting down the borders, I guess, for the most part, but also um, you know uh, also uh, protecting their their nationalist constituencies. Uh, so which one is, seems to be dominant now? Putting down the borders or bringing the borders up? Well, you know, to be honest, it's still a struggle. It's still quite a struggle. You have so many people in Europe um, even supporting the cause of the refugees. Um, the media seems to fluctuate between, uh, you know, the plight of the refugees. And recently, I'm sure people must have seen this seven-year-old boy who was who was picked out from the rubble and he's bloodied and he's um, uh, he's covered in uh, in dust uh, and that becomes a symbol and then you have uh, main media fluctuating between okay this uh, there's a huge influx to we should do more and the same with the population there's so many who are supporting it um, so I think that's one of the biggest issues which is leading to a rise of nationalism apart from economy of course um, just recently, um, the European Commission's president, so the European Commission is one of the three main institutions of the EU and it proposes law. Uh, it's like a bureaucratic body of the EU. And the president of that body, Jean-Claude Juncker, who uh, pleasantly surprised me and he said, uh, we need to uh, bring down borders, they're the worst invention ever made by politicians. <laughs> <laughs> and it was sweet. Uh, and it's basically said that, that um, people need to fight against nationalism and they need to um, 
not follow populists uh, because of course uh, as he said the work ultimately leads to war and it's so true the future is quite uncertain at the moment here in Europe yes um, Yes, and uh, there, was, there was some privacy laws, some strict privacy laws that had been considered in uh, Germany, but now they're being reconsidered because uh, people are not so sure they want to protect privacy uh, given the problem they have uh, with terrorism and with the migrants. So you have, it, it seems to me that 2016 is kind of a tipping point all over Europe. Which way shall we go? Shall we go to uh, repression? Shall we go to hum humanitarianism? Uh, shall we protect ourselves on a national level, or shall we try to strengthen ourselves on an EU level? Um, and you know, I feel that anything could happen. An, an event or two, a terror attack or two, could change the way the tipping point works. Right, you're, you're completely right. And there are lots of changes happening here in Europe. I mean, uh, uh, jihadist terrorism is a relatively new phenomenon in Europe. and. Um, of course, Europe has faced a lot of terrorism, but in the 70s, uh, and that was, um, well, you, you know, the IRA in uh, Ireland and the UK and so on, various terrorist organizations, but these were mainly intended at nation states uh, and a particular uh, country. And this is, of course, a very different modus operandi of terrorism. Uh, it's, it's an organization which crosses borders. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, and most countries don't know how to deal with it. I mean, we've spoken about how Belgium Belgium dealt with uh, so poorly with the terror attacks, and it could have been avoided, or you know how they've coped up with it. Uh, and just before, so I've done quite a bit of research actually on counter terrorism, and what is surprising is um, in two thousand eight to until very recently, um, most websites they, they were, there's very strict laws protecting freedom of uh, expression uh, and and uh, and even um, child pornography websites were not taken down mm -hmm. and so when you have this jihadist content um, what do you do with it you know if your laws don't support you to take strict action but that's changing countries are now um, mulling over how to best tackle um, terrorism would it mean giving up liberties uh, or you know um, patrolling borders externally, how, how to do it. So Europe is really coming to terms with it. But what's surprising and shocking I read today uh, even is that um, the German government has told its population after the Second World War actually to stock food and water for f at least five to ten days. Uh, and this comes right in the aftermath of all those attacks, uh, especially in Munich. Uh, last month, where um, where where people yeah. had to clear malls and streets and basically go into strangers' apartments to take shelter. So, so yes. this is a new development. Yeah, new. That's new, and it's a little scary. And and the, in at least uh, I think Germany and uh, France, there's issues about the burkas um, mm. and uh, attempts to um, uh, require people not to wear them to make it, I guess, criminal to wear or they can't come to school and wear? What have you heard about that? Yeah, I think it's a silly debate, honestly. Uh, and there's so many people who support it. Uh, basically, two cities in France, Nice and Cannes, have uh, banned the burkini. Uh, for those who don't know it, it's, it's kind of a, uh Islamic uh, okay swimming costume, which basically looks like a wetsuit you know, with the hoodie as well. So it's a covered swimming suit uh, in Lycra. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, um, the debate is more tipping on racism, I feel. If you go to the French beaches, um, you know, people hardly wear anything or, you know, who cares what they wear or they don't wear. Yeah. The debate well, a lot, of, a lot of French beaches, they don't wear anything, right? <laughs> Of course not. The new day speeches, you know, uh, a beach should be the last place where, you know, you have fashion police. <laughs> and the people who are now um, wearing burkinis on the beach are being um, uh, uh, fined. Uh, so, and fined heavily, actually. But I, I think it's silly. I think it's a silly direction. It's uh, baseless. And, you know, if you have a fashion police 
with a lot of lot more faux pas committed in Paris <laughs> than on than wearing a burkini. My only suggestion would be don't wear a black one or you're gonna get mistaken by, for a seal by Jaws. I, I have to get to Europe so I can see what's going on. <laughs> um, but but I, the French. Um, I, I was. Go ahead. Sorry. No, the deputy prime minister also came in support of this ban, which I really feel is so ridiculous, you know. But yeah, that's where we are going now. We have a lack of. Uh, we have an identity crisis. Yes. In your yes. That's what it is. People don't know where to go. And, and I think that, that that creates opportunistic possibilities for people like Mr. Putin and for that matter for the terrorists. Uh, they can see that Europe is a little bit disorganized right now, doesn't have a, you know, a combined response, doesn't have um, a, a level of collaboration to deal with these difficult issues. And I think right. opportunists will take advantage of that. No? I think the opportunists are within Europe. Is this populist party, is the far right, the extremists who would, you know, exploit the agenda, come to power, because so much of this nationalist movement is about power, mm -hmm. and it's about elections, mm -hmm. and it's about staying in power. Mm -hmm. So you have mainstream politicians who have made really silly and unfortunate um, decisions like David Cameron made with the Brexit referendum to stay in power. And I think the biggest enemy of Europe is within uh, mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah. Well, you know, what's very interesting is that people saw Brexit, it was only 60 days ago, uh, they saw Brexit as a, a, a blow to the economy of, uh, of, of the UK, and for that matter, a blow to the economy of the EU. Um, and now we've had 60 days to kind of cool down about it. Um, and I wondered, uh, you know, what people think about it now, both from the EU side and uh, the UK side. I, and, I've, and I've noticed uh, on your list of articles, there's some articles um, talking about uh, how uh, some of the uh, some of the politicians in in uh, the UK want to appoint themselves as emissaries to Europe, as if as if Europe, Europe was further off, you know, a more foreign country than before, um, and they and they want to uh, you know, be the representative of the UK in Europe. Uh, what is happening? I mean, it's a it's a new mindset, isn't it? Yes, it's very confusing. I mean, Theresa May, the new prime minister, came out saying Brexit means Brexit. But what does that exactly mean? Nobody is clear. The only one who had a plan was Nicola Sturgeon, the leader of Scotland. Uh, mm -hmm. And she knew exactly what to say and what to do. Nobody has an idea what Brexit actually means, what it's going to entail, uh, how much losses there are going to be already. Uh, the pound has gone down so much against the euro and other currencies. Uh, it's created quite a bit of loss to the UK economy. Um, the, 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 the problem is that the media have not reported as much about opinions now as they had before and during the referendum. Mm. So that's the main issue. So the information is not being circulated properly. I think Britain and, and most of the people here think that the UK made such a bad decision. Um, and it's only going to get worse because they're going to be locked out of uh, a market uh, which is basically the world's largest economy. Uh, yeah. Together, the 28 countries make up, you know, the world's largest economic space. Um, if you if you read also uh, some of the reports which came, so for example, uh, farmers in Wales uh, voted against the EU, but they get 60% of their salary from the EU because of this common agricultural policy which subsidizes them. That seems silly uh, to vote against it, yeah? They, they voted against themselves. <laughs> uh, shooting so, yourself in the foot. <laughs> yes, and now with the latest reports say that um, Brexit will happen, so the British exit from the EU will happen by the end of 2019. First it was 2017, but now it's 2019. Uh, and I think it's going to derail the UK and the EU's external relations, uh, which is also, by the way, uh, the topic of my next paper, ah, which I'd us. be happy to share. Yes, yes, tell us about your next paper, because it's directly on the channel here. No pun yes. intended. <laughs> so, um, my new paper uh, deals with what um, Brexit, Brexit's impact will be on uh, uh, the EU's relation with the world, especially Asia. Um, and I think it's going to completely derail relations. 
this is for a couple of reasons. So the EU has negotiated a set of agreements, free trade agreements with uh, with a lot of Asian countries. They're under negotiation still. Uh, the only one signed, of course, is with Korea, which of course the US also has. <laughs> But the other agreements are going to be in jeopardy because, you know, they are, they are no longer valid. And these negotiations have lasted, for example, 10 years in the case of India, but a lot more as well. So already trade is going to be impacted severely. FTAs are so important and the U.S. already has the TPP, so it's way ahead. Yeah. Uh, but the other impact is going to be um, because Asian countries have traditionally interacted more with uh, the EU, EU's individual member states. So this is only going to get worse, um, both for the EU and the UK. Yeah. Well, it was, it was kind of predictable, but now it's, uh, it's happening. In, in case people are wondering, it's happening. I mean, if I, if I were far away, if I were in India or China, I would look at the EU and say that that place is less together than it was. It is less a power to deal with, uh, both on a geopolitical level and on, on an economic level. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I don't take it as uh, seriously. I, in fact, uh, I, um, I, I would like to compete and win against it economically. Don't you think that, uh, you know, that the weakness uh, offers a kind of economic opportunity to other people uh, and, and they, will see, they will see what happened as a weakness and then you know, it will reinforce itself as a spiral. It's not a good thing for the EU, no? Definitely not. And I think what it has done is probably strengthen the position of the US uh, because the US appears as, a, as the more reliable Western partner. Until now it was the EU. It was a huge union of 28 countries, you know, politically united, uh, economically united of course, um, but, but it has left the US as the only credible Western partner. You see? So that's I think interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. And at the same time, the U.S. is trying to shore up, uh, you know, Brit Britain's prospects and trying to do, uh, you know, deals directly, uh, trade deals with, uh, with Britain. And so uh, maybe that helps Britain, but I, I don't think it helps the EU much. But then I wanted to ask you about Corbyn, the labor guy. Wasn't labor against, uh, you know, continuing in the, in the EU? And yet Corbyn is still active on the issue. He's been in the news. What, what is going on with him? Yeah, apparently the, the Labour Party is in shambles because nobody wants Jeremy Corbyn in leadership, uh, his MEPs, his colleagues. But he has support of the public somehow, which is, um, is an enigma. Um, he, he's not a charismatic leader. But he's uh, joined he's not... Donald Trump. He's, Sorry? He's allied himself with Donald Trump. Yeah, well, you know, you can understand. I mean, it's a it's a group of motley fellows. Yeah, it's an odd group now because you have a socialist, a uh, labor leader, who's now aligning with Trump, and uh, I don't know who could align with Trump. In strange, <laughs> strange, strange beyond strange. Strange bedfellows. All uh, right, just going down your list. Uh, uh, there's one one more thing before we do a break, and that is uh, I saw a very brief abbreviated reference in your list of uh, news possibilities that there was uh, a suicide uh, bombing in Turkey uh, and it was at a wedding. Oh my goodness, what a thing. Uh, and at 50 people were killed at the su and that And that probably was so brief because, uh, you know, the, the people that were reporting the news didn't have any detail. Has, has there been any detail since then? Very unfortunate details. Apparently the suicide bomber was a 12 to 14 year old boy. It's really sad. Um, it was a Kurdish wedding and, you know, it was politically motivated. But, but the fact that they're using children like this is, uh, is the worst possible thing you could imagine. So uh, there's the saddest bit coming out of Turkey. I mean. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. Well, Turkey has a lot of challenges today. I mean, um, not only with the Kurdish... Uh, uh, history and you know the ongoing struggle but with ISIS um, and with the EU and also itself I mean you know after the coup uh, Erdogan has strengthened his hold on the country so significantly he's liberated even prisoners 35,000 prisoners uh, to make place for uh, coup protesters 
uh, sorry, the ones who, who he thought supported the coup. Uh, and those, the list includes a lot of academics as well. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the worst uh, move for Turkey. Yeah, not good. Not good in a, in a, in a, in a region which is not having a good time. Well, let me uh, take a short break, Gauri. That's Gauri Kandakar, Global Relations Forum. Uh, we're catching up on so many things in Europe. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome to thinktechhawaii.com. This is Johnson Choi, your host. My focus is Asia in Reveal. We talk about interesting subjects in Asia. Be sure to check the thinktech.com website on the next topic. Thank you. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, Hawaii's leading digital media platform for civic engagement, raising public awareness on tech, energy, diversification, and globalism. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Hi, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. I'd love you to join us every week, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. for Ehana Kako. Let's work together. We report every week on the good things going on in our state as well as the better things that can go on in the future. We have guests covering everything from the economy, the government, and society. See you Mondays on Ehana Kako at 2 o'clock p.m. Until then, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, we thought not much was happening in Europe, but in fact, a lot is happening. So much is happening that we can't possibly cover it all. So uh, we'll have to we'll have to get Gowrie back in a few weeks and uh, and catch up on these things. But let's turn east. Uh, the, th the two pieces that that uh, occurred to me here is one is uh, Eastern European countries are launching campaigns to lure citizens back from the West. I mean, you know, it's no surprise, I suppose, that a lot of countries in the eastern part of Europe are losing their citizens to the, the glories of the West, I suppose. Um, and now they want to lure them back. What's that all about? That's, it sounds like uh, more nationalism, Gary. Well, it's, um, it's a little bit to do with nationalism, but I think it's also uh, to do with uh, demographic change. Mm -hmm. um, when the Central and Eastern European countries joined um, the EU, and it was a huge uh, expansion. So, 10 countries joined the EU in uh, 2007, um, followed by Romania and Bulgaria in 2012. Uh, at that time, when these countries joined, they were much worse off, I would say. Um, they were economically backward, uh, and, and, and um, they saw Western Europe as, you know, an area of uh, huge development and, you know, job opportunities. And so a lot of East, Central and Eastern European um, educated workers, uh, educated people, workers and all kinds of uh, um, uh, populations move to the West, especially to the UK, <laughs> which uh -huh. is one of the reasons why Brexit also was, yeah. you know, pushed forward on the population, um, but also to Germany. Uh, and, and, and Belgium and all the other countries. However, with the, um, with the economic crisis and, you know, the recessions that followed, um, Western Europe has, has been reeling, you know, it's still reeling from the economic shocks. Um, but at the same time, thanks to Europe, uh, C Central and Eastern Europe has developed a lot because uh, what the European Union does is also have uh, distributes these um, funds called structural funds and these are used for um, development, uh, infrastructure, etc, etc, uh, also human resources. Now these countries are in a much better position uh, mm. and they do need their uh, labor back, the qualified labor. Ah. Now the labor also uh, has a lot of experience um, and there is employment. Ah. So now they, they need their own diaspora back. Because they're in growth phase. Well, you know, what's, what's very interesting about that is that the, uh, you know, the Brexit was a blow to the EU, a uh, disruptive blow. And now it's sort of sorting itself out again, uh, you know, as indicated by our first news story where uh, 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 Angela Merkel and uh, Francois Holland and uh, uh, what's his name from... Um, um, Matteo Renzi. Frenzy uh, from uh, Italy met and and you wonder you know what what was their their common point is that they are the three biggest economies i suppose uh in europe but but europe is in flux and we may find i'd be interested in your thought about this we may find that 
there's a rebalancing going on, an economic rebalancing, where the next time you look at Europe, the next time you look at the EU, we find that the Eastern Euro European countries um, are stronger, relatively speaking, uh, perhaps a stronger uh, part of the EU. Is this, is this happening? Is the, is, is the economic power drifting east now? Uh, is that what's going to happen? <laughs> well, funnily enough, um, or sadly enough, uh, Italy, Italy's uh, debt to GDP output ratio is, uh, is, is, is just better off than Greece. So it's the second uh, least uh, attractive in Europe, you know, it's the worst off, second last worst off. Uh, uh. <laughs> you say it. Yeah, so it has huge debt. Um, growth across Europe is quite poor. Um, it's not a growing economy. It's not like Asia, um, which is, you know, growing at rapid speed. Um, the Nordic countries continue to do better. They're the ones that are the richest at the moment. Of course, the um, Sweden, Finland are much better off and have remained that, remain so. Germany is still leading the EU in terms of growth and GDP and output. <laughs> and economics but you know what's going to happen um, this is somehow a good trend that uh, Europe is balancing itself out because these countries used to be really more poor off they just uh, come out of the Soviet bloc um, and they had to be integrated well and now that they are well off they are you know more independent less dependent on structural funds um, the EU can really push for more uh, uh, economic integration uh, it most of these countries share the euro uh, so they need more fiscal coordination uh, a, a proper monetary and fiscal union uh, and so they can better coordinate the economic um, la create a more level playing field in a mm -hmm. way and, I mean and that's probably a good thing for the EU to, to see that new vitality uh, and it's okay to have the focus uh, shift a little bit to the east but uh, I wonder if Mr. Putin would agree. Um, I rather think that he doesn't like the idea and will have his own measures waiting to, um, you know, to undermine this process, don't you think? Yes. Um, for Putin, um, Ukraine and Belarus are the limit. <laughs> mm -hmm. NATO in particular should not expand beyond. Uh, and that was one of the reasons which led to, you know, the, the annexation of Crimea. Um, and more control over Belarus. So Putin sees those as a buffer between Europe uh, and himself, between NATO and, and, and Russia, basically. Um, and, and that's, you, you do see recently more uh, aggression in, uh, towards uh, Ukraine. Um, there are a lot of political opponents uh, that are being uh, killed off uh, in, in UK in more Kremlin, yeah. Kremlin opponents. It's got Mr. Uh, Putin's signature all over it, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's not a... <laughs> it's, it's, it's an open secret in a way who's doing it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a resurgent aspect in Russian foreign policy. Um, and the more uh, Russia builds up uh, near Ukraine's borders, the more control it's going to seek. And this is what's happening basically uh, at the Ukraine borders, um, I will be tweeting later on a map uh, yeah. which shows how much military Russia has built up near Ukraine's borders. Yeah. Um, That's one honest, of the scariest things about uh, the Donald Trump campaign is his connection with Putin and what Putin is doing lately. <laughs> I, I read the, a very funny uh, quote which said that Russia, um, an article actually in New York Times, we we said that uh, uh, Donald Trump is actually a Russian oligarch. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> well, in a way. The best of, they make a, a good couple, I think, Putin and Trump. Uh, they have a similar wavelength. And, uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, so I think uh, it would be a new deton for Russia-U.S. Uh, relations. <laughs> Well, I have one, only one more thing to ask you before we close, uh, Gary, and that is yes. uh, this thing which I had never heard of before, which was in your list of articles. It's called Uber Eats. Uber Eats, that's ah. the Uber car company, but now they're delivering food, and they're coming to Brussels. You must be excited about that. We haven't heard about that, but 
apparently you're going to have the benefit of it soon, eh? <laughs> I am really excited about it. Um, they deliver, they're, they're going to deliver food. I don't know exactly how uh, well they're going to work, but I mean, any, anything that delivers good food quickly is, <laughs> is okay in my books. <laughs> so I'm super excited for Uber Eats to come to Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to keep in touch with you about that because I think you're the test market. And later on, we'll, we'll have the benefit, only if it succeeds in Brussels. <laughs> I will be your lab rat, yes. <laughs> Gary, it's wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's Gary Kondakar. He's uh, the director of uh, the Global Relations Forum, uh, headquartered in Brussels. And we enjoy so much talking to her every couple of weeks. Thank you, Gary. Uh, enjoy this, the rest of the summer and vacances here in August. And we hope to see you in September. Aloha. Thanks.